cool. Uh, can we talk a little bit about the the woman who helped you out while you were uh, incarcerated at Folsom Prison? Who helped you out with uh, uh, writing your songs? The the yeah the uh, well, what do you want to know about her? <laughs> Uh, just how she assisted you in uh, maintaining your your music and how she brought you the the cassettes and that kind of thing enabled you to record. And... Well, like I said, you know, when I was in Folsom, it was um, they they seemed to have it out for me in in in, in the respect where uh, they had a great big music department there and they would not allow me to to participate in it, you know, um, which was a big slight on me and uh, and a big setback for me because that's what I was really looking forward to when I went to prison. I, I thought maybe I could be in the music department and help a lot of the young musicians and, you know, teach them about recording and teach them about the board and, and, and playing and, and writing songs and structure and all that kind of stuff. And I was really looking forward to doing that. So when I wasn't allowed to participate in the music department, it, w- it really hurt. Um, and not only was I not allowed to participate in the music department, uh, uh, a lot of the COs in, in Folsom, um, old Marlboro men, redneck uh, attitude uh, type human beings were um, were really out just to teach Rick James a lesson, you know, and, and, and make his time there as rough as they possibly could. Well, there was one particular woman who worked there, and um, she was loved by all the inmates because of her personality and because of her, uh, her, her, her attitude. You know, she has such a great attitude. Um, you know, most of the inmates called her mom, and um, she had pretty strong. She had a pretty powerful uh, position in Folsom, and um, I can say this now because she's no longer working there, which which is probably a good thing for her. But um, she realized that uh, what was happening because she worked it within the system, and um, she knew that I I was having a hard time, and that I you know I, uh, I she knew that I, I I couldn't read music, but I could play. And um, I was writing a lot of songs, and I was forgetting them. As soon as I'd write them, I'd forget them because I, I couldn't notate them. And um, so what she did was she gave, she would get me a tape recorder, a cheap tape recorder. She'd sneak it in, and I would record. I would write and put everything down on tape, and I'd fill up five or six tapes, and then I'd get those tapes out. And then she'd uh, bring me six or seven or more tapes, and I'd fill those tapes up, and, and I'd, send out, you know, I'd send the songs out. So I ended up with like 40 tapes still from back to back, uh, which 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 uh, accumulated to about over 400 songs, and um, that's how I wrote music, and that's how I survived. And uh, God bless her for for doing that, you know. And uh, uh, just asking, we talk a little bit about some of the older stuff. Sure. Cool. Um, uh, let's start with the, let's start with Tina Marie and just tell us how and when you guys met and talk a little bit about your relationship with her uh, then and today. Well, I first met Tina in 1978. No, I, I would say it was closer towards 79. I had my first album out, Come Get It, and um, I think it had gone platinum or something. And um, I was this young kid on fire in Motown, and uh, everyone was anticipating my next album and anticipating... Um, a working relationship with me, you know, I was kind of wild, man, you know, during those days. And I remember being in Motown and <clears throat> walking around and all these, uh, with, with, with my uh, family, you know, with my boys with me, and we were all just walking around from office to office saying hello to people or whatever we were doing. And I remember walking past an office and um, hearing this voice come out of it. And uh, I opened the door and it was this girl singing at piano. It was this little tiny white girl. And she was singing her heart out. And I thought it was incredible. I'd never heard a voice like that come out of a, such a small person. And uh, especially, you know, the fact that she was white and singing R&B with such conviction and detail that it was, you know, it was, it was amazing to me. It was a truly amazing thing, amazing sight and sound. And um, I kind of talked to her a little bit, and she said she was with Motown, and she was signed there, and, I, and I, which I couldn't understand because she was, you know, she was so strong as an artist. I had never heard of her. And she said nothing ever came out. The Motown hadn't released anything on her. They couldn't find the right thing to do with her. They didn't know what to do, on and on. And I said, well, I, you know, I wish you success. And, and, I, and I moved on, you know, and that was pretty well that. I got a call about three weeks later when I was in Buffalo from her manager um, asking me, well, how would I like to record her? And uh, would I like to work with her? And I, I immediately jumped at the chance um, 
because one of my biggest things was when I was at Motown, and I felt when I did become successful, that I, I wanted to touch on and produce and write for a lot of different people. So um, this was my opportunity for my first act outside of myself and the Stone City Band. Well, I hadn't done the Stone City Band yet, but I was contemplating it. So this was really my first act. And they sent me some stuff of what she sounded like to Buffalo, and I, I liked the way she sounded. And uh, I wrote Deja Vu for her and, and a bunch of other stuff, Sucker for Love and uh, Can't Love Anymore and a few other songs. And uh, we called the album Wild and Peaceful. And it was a huge success. Um, that's actually how we met and how it, how it all started. Uh, we ended up working with each other over the years, off and on, and touring together. Um, right now, our relationship is not really what it, it it should be, you know, or what it could be, because you know, basically, she's her own person, and, and I'm my own person. And the romance, our romance, that whatever romance that was there in the early days, has been gone, is dead and gone. And sometimes uh, people harbor feelings, and they still carry flames. And uh, I'm not saying I do, but you know, I'm saying people do in general. And me and Tina are no different. Um, we're um, not really that close right now. And it's I, I choose it to be that way. Uh, when we were doing Urban Rhapsody, she was supposed to sing uh, uh, Never Say You Love Me, a song, uh, a song that I wrote for me and her. And uh, she ended up trying to act like a diva, this grandiose person, you know, and... Uh, really pissed me off. So I put JoJo on the record for the Mary Jane Girl. So I think did a great job, a great job on it. And me and her really haven't spoken uh, since then. She's she's upset, and uh, I'm a little still, I'm pissed off. That's why she wasn't at the House of Blues. 